do take a seat, if that's okay. Let's think about these two passages together for a moment. The gospel of Jesus is good news for the oppressed and the oppressor. Let me explain what I mean. We've already noticed that Jesus enters Jericho. He's on his way to Jerusalem and meets two people, a blind beggar whose name we know is Bartimaeus because Mark records the same story and gives us his name, and Zacchaeus, the chief tax collector. If you're a blind beggar, you're not just at the bottom of society, you're excluded from it. You've no education, no support, you live on the streets, but more than that, you're seen as unclean. Because in that age, disability was seen as a sign of sin. So your disability meant you were rejected by society. No one at this time would have imagined for a moment that a famous rabbi would acknowledge the existence of, let alone talk, to someone like Bartimaeus. Society ignored him, so teachers like Jesus would surely do the same. So perhaps it's kind of surprising to discover that despite Bartimaeus' blindness and the obvious fact that he cannot see Jesus, it's not actually his lack of sight that prevents him from meeting Jesus. It's the crowd. When Bartimaeus cries out to Jesus, the crowd tell him to be quiet. More than that, in verse 39, it says, those who led the way rebuked him and told him to be quiet. That's the city elders of Jericho, the leadership who are trying to prevent him from meeting Jesus. In their eyes, Jesus' teaching was for them, not for someone on the margins of society. But you're a biblically literate lot, and I suspect you remember what Jesus actually says earlier in Luke, in Luke 4, at the beginning of his ministry, three years earlier, where he says, he stands in the synagogue and reads Isaiah. You know this passage? The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind to set the oppressed free. The gospel sets the oppressed free. If it does not, it is not the gospel. To the city elders and the crowd, Jesus is kind of an interesting new rabbi, perhaps with some oh, interesting takes on passages in the Old Testament to discuss in home group. But to Bartimaeus, this gospel is everything. A new life, transformation. Sight means the possibility of work, income, a place to live, relationships, Love, a future. This gospel is not just theoretical and theological. It's tangible. Somehow at the margins of society, the raw power of the gospel becomes more visible. At Easter this year, I, just to yeah, drop my exciting travel schedule, flew out to Princeton in the U.S., and I met a Jesuit priest, Father Gregory Boyle, whose parishes was one, parish is one of the toughest gang-ridden districts of L.A., a total police no-go zone where murder and drugs is rife. At the height of the violence in 1992, there were a 1,000 gang-related killings in that area in a single year. He quickly realized that in a place like this, the gospel cannot be theoretical. It's practical 
and pastoral. Good news has to be good news, right? In the following years, he started a school, a bakery, numerous social enterprises, a catering company, a clothing company, and, and so it goes on. Violence waned, and his project became the world's largest and longest-running gang intervention project. And in the context of that hope, he called people to discover the Jesus who can make you see. And many, many responded. Will you and I commit ourselves to working at the margins and sharing this gospel of hope? Or are we part of the crowd, keeping those on the margins quiet because we want a safer Jesus for ourselves? I want to do that, but can I be totally honest with you? All my life, I've sort of been scared of what it might mean to truly put the teachings of Jesus into practice. I'm surely not on my own in this. Do you, don't you ever think that? If I really went the whole way, what would change? Do I dare do that? I feel that. Do I dare really hold this thing? And so often, I struggle. But it's not just individual Christians. Sometimes the institution of the church, the power structures of the church have not wanted to hear the voices of people on the margins. The growing number of victims of abuse who are ignored or silenced by the church is a painful reminder of the power of the crowd to keep others out of sight. Martin Luther King, whose preaching is just a again and again an inspiration to me, says and reminds us the church is not the place you come to, it's the place you go from. It's our job as the church to serve at the margins and stand with the poor, the powerless, the voiceless whose dignity has been denied, the easily despised, the readily left out, the demonized and the disposable. This is a less comfortable gospel. By the way, we've invited Father Gregory, Gregory Boyle to the UK next summer, and he's coming to hang out with teenagers uh, in the UK for a week, and we're really excited. And at Youthscape, we've committed ourselves to working more and more with the 40% of children and young people in Luton who are growing up in poverty. So Jesus encounters the oppressed in Bartimaeus, but immediately he goes on to encounter the oppressor, Zacchaeus. Can we, can we just have an honest talk about Zacchaeus for a moment? Because I think we've got a bit of work to do, you and I, to kind of get a proper idea of who he was in our heads. If you've been to Sunday school like me, when you think of Zacchaeus, you think of a short, smiling, happy man grinning in a tree, don't you? Can we just park that for a moment and think about Zacchaeus as he actually was? In a sense, the closest comparison I can come up with is a Nazi collaborator in wartime France, a Frenchman helping the Nazis oppress his own people and maybe even send them to their deaths. You see, as you know, Zacchaeus is a tax collector for the Romans, and remember, Israel is, is an occupied country by a brutal and oppressive regime. This is like Russian-occupied parts of Ukraine. There are soldiers garrisoned in every town. And with the Romans, crucifixions are common. The Romans collect taxes from people, and they use men like Zacchaeus to do it. Zacchaeus is unpaid. He's given an amount to present to the Roman authorities, and he gets to keep anything he gets on top for himself. He's hated not only for extorting money from the population, but also for collaborating with the Romans. So having met the oppressed, Jesus is about to meet the oppressor. This is why Luke puts these two stories together. Luke says, Zacchaeus ran ahead of the crowd to see Jesus. And this is obviously, Luke says, because of his height. Sorry to those of you that are also without height. But I think, I wonder, 
if there was more to it. I wonder if he might have been nervous of being in a crowd where a quick stab with a dagger would have brought him conveniently to an end. He climbs a tree, perhaps not just to see, but also to hide from the crowd. The sycamore fig tree has low-hanging branches and lots of foliage, so it's likely he could have watched Jesus passing by without anyone noticing. So along comes Jesus. The passage is clear that Jesus isn't planning to stay in Jericho. That itself, by the way, is a massive breach of custom. In those days, it was normal for a well-known rabbi like Jesus, first of all, to be welcomed some miles out of the city by the town's leaders and even a crowd. That's why, that's why they're leading the way in when they meet Bartimaeus. And they walk a visitor into the city. Things happen wonderfully slowly in the Middle East. A banquet would have been prepared, and Jesus would have stayed the night as a guest of honor. That's what people are expecting, a massive blowout feast, and then Jesus gets put up in a five-star hotel, not a travel lodge. Right from the start, Luke makes it clear that Jesus plans to break with convention and pass through Jericho without stopping. And then Jesus engages in conversation With all people, the oppressor. He stops and makes conversation with this man who's hated and vilified by the crowd, not unreasonably. Not only that, he changes his plan and invites himself to stay with Zacchaeus. Who's unhappy at this news? The crowd, of course. How can Jesus' grace extend to someone who oppresses his fellow countrymen any more than it should extend to a blind beggar? But this is the breadth of God's grace. This is what Paul means when he writes to the Ephesians. I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. I love to imagine that somewhere in Jericho that night, there's like an empty room with a massive banquet and food going cold. (laughs) And while Jesus is spending the night at the home of one of the most vilified citizens in the whole of Jericho, So as a result of this, Zacchaeus makes a public declaration, which you know well, to give half of his wealth away and pay back people he's cheated four times the amount. I'm not sure the maths makes sense. And we could go down this rabbit hole. There's a bit more to this that meets the eye. And to be fair, nowhere in the story does it say that he follows through on his promise. You might assume that, but interestingly, we showed this story to a group of young people recently, and they were much more skeptical. They saw Zacchaeus' promise more as a performance for the crowd. That's what he thought people wanted him to say, and they thought Jesus was naive to be taking him at face value. I have read this story a million times. I had never noticed that actually in the story, Zacchaeus doesn't actually give anything back. Not saying he didn't, just that it doesn't say that. Perhaps I'll leave that thought with you. For young people, I think, they're rightly wary of people making big promises in this culture. And they're much more cynical about people's motives for impressing the crowd. And I can totally understand that. Politicians promising net zero, celebrities making outrageous claims, the church making promises it does not keep. They are suspicious, and I don't really blame them. But Jesus does trust him. And the story ends in verse 9 when Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. Don't miss that phrasing. Jesus is saying it intentionally. This man too is a son of Abraham. He's one of you. This is Jesus' point throughout the story. The oppressed and the oppressor are more like you than you realize. 
They are not others. Perhaps there's something of the oppressed and the oppressor in all of us. So let's, let's pull this all together in the last few moments we have, and I'm sorry if this is a bit longer than I intended. We're literally skipping through this story. Where are you and I in this story? I fear I too often play the role of the crowd. I'm quick to decide who deserves God's grace. Quick to judge. Do I sometimes stop people from seeing Jesus? Do you? This isn't just about us as individual Christians. It's also the role the church can sometimes play. As an institution, we can consciously or unconsciously stop people from seeing Jesus. The middle class tone of so many churches that makes many people from different backgrounds feel they are not welcome or this isn't simply the place for them, for example. I can remember one teenager coming to faith and then turning up at church the next Sunday in a shirt and tie because they thought that's what the church would expect of them. And the truth is, there were some people in the church who did. But the church is not meant to only look like John Lewis in worship. <laughs> and I'm a fan of John Lewis. It's a gathering of all peoples, all cultures, all traditions, all backgrounds. So how do we as Christchurch ensure that we never play the part of the crowd? Perhaps that's something to reflect on this week. But above all, this story is about the scandal of salvation that is offered readily to both the oppressed and the oppressor. A beggar standing at traffic lights in Luton and Vladimir Putin are both welcomed into that grace. That is hard to stomach, but it is nevertheless true. And that same grace is extended to you this morning. However you find yourself here, and whatever secrets you harbor, today, Jesus says, salvation has come to this house. In the words of the colic that we read at the start of the service, may that same grace meet us this morning. May your unconditional love touch our lives, and may we become carriers of that grace to others, signposts to the scandal of salvation.